Hey guys, welcome to City Building Doctor. There's my fantastic logo. And today we're gonna be going over some basic tips and tricks in Pharaoh. Now I did a video like this for Caesar 3, but uh, the games are actually very, very different. So all I have to do is start going through these points here. And uh, I just brought up my notes in case you're wondering what that was. <laughs> so, just so you guys learn something immediately at the start of this video, if we go ahead and bring up statues, let's say a large statue here. A lot of people don't know this, but when you have a statue up like this, you can press the R key on your keyboard and it will change the kind of statue that you can place down. And there's actually like four different statues for each size and then it rotates them and it cycles through all of these things here. Look at that. So the variety of statues that we have, if I were to go to like the small statues, we have that, 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 and that, right? So we got those small statues. These are the medium statues. Right, so we got those medium statues. And for large statues, we have this one, of course, that everyone would know, we have that one. We have this one, and my personal favorite, this really tall one. Look at that. Look at those variety of statues. Point number one, you've learned something already. And you can see here, I like using these tall statues over here. <laughs> now, my notes are over there in case you're wondering why I'm looking there. So, point number two. Now, this is a point that's the same across all of these classic city builders. If you're having problems with stability, things going, like evolving, devolving, your houses crashing and all sorts of stuff, just make sure that when you build blocks of houses, you should build blocks of houses. And in Pharaoh, you have to have one intersection, but the fewer intersections, the better, right? So you can see here, I have this heart-shaped block, which I came up with, and you need one intersection because entertainment buildings, like booths, bandstands, or pavilions, they need to be on an intersection, right? So you can see my pavilion here, it's on an intersection. But how you sort of mitigate that is, because with intersections, walkers go all over the place, they don't pass the right houses, with a loop like this. You can see this road here, it's a loop. Now, what you wanna do is put the service buildings, which send out a walker, you wanna put them near that intersection. So for example, my market here is near the intersection, not only because it allows quick access to the granary and the storage yards outside, but when things are near the intersection, right? If, let's say this, uh, this fireman here, this, uh, what are they called? This city is cool. Fire marshals. Fire marshals, he's gonna walk out here. And if he walks left, right, following my mouse here, it's gonna be fine. He'll pass all the houses. And by the time he reaches here, he's walked so far, his only destination is to go back home. And the shortest route would be to cover back this way. And he will never walk up that road. If he were to walk this way and go up this intersection, the best case scenario is he comes back and walks this way, continuing his journey through all the houses. But if he walks up the intersection and comes back this way, if he started like really far away, like let's say the fire thing was here. Uh, let's say we're following this fire guy, right? He could walk all the way along here, up this intersection and then back the way he came. It's pretty bad. But because this is close to the intersection, he will walk up this way. And even if he goes back this way, he's still got enough movement to go all the way here, and then he'll run out of movement around here, and the shortest route would be to continue his journey back. So when you have a, the intersection, build all the service buildings near here, near the intersection, because it will sort of keep things uh, as stable as possible. Good, that's point number two. Point number three, let me just have a bit of my coffee here, hold on. Ah, point number three. Because some of you might be coming from Caesar to Pharaoh, do right-click your bazaars and then see the special orders there. Click on the special orders. You can tell bazaars what to buy and what not to buy. If you come from Caesar 3, you don't know this is a thing, right? Because uh, this is the only game which does this because in Zeus, uh, you have separate, like you have a market square and then you build separate shops in it and it's the same in Emperor. Caesar 3, you have no control. This is sort of an elegant evolution from Caesar 3. And you can see here, this market is only buying two things, game meat and pottery, right? Because that's all this block needs, game meat and pottery. If you look over here, 
Why this is important is because you could have different markets for different things. So let's say uh, this bazaar here is buying all sorts of things. Let's say I wanted to split the workload because these are big palatial estates. They require three types of food. You could have one bazaar set to buying uh, grain, one bazaar set to buying fish, and one bazaar set to buying game meat. And that way, when the bazaar ladies go out to buy what they need, they don't need to buy everything because it can really put a strain on the bazaar because they've only got one, one market lady that goes out and buys things and brings it back. So if things are too far away, by the time the market lady comes back with the third type of food, it would have run out of the first type of food and then they'll just go buy that and they'll never buy any of these other things, right? So, the reason why I can get away with one bazaar here is because everything is super close. The bazaar lady literally just walks out, beer, pottery, linen, luxury goods. Food is a little further away, but I found this, this works okay, right? Uh, and again, over here, the bazaar in this area is only buying three things. Game meat, pottery, beer, right? So this area does need beer, by the way, but you can see here I've got two bazaars. So this one is buying game meat and beer. This one is buying game meat and pottery. So the workload is split, right? Because this is a big housing area and feeding all those people all the different resources, sometimes two bazaars makes it okay. And you can see here all the beer stored up and here all the pottery stored up. Fantastic. That's point number three, sort of uh, allocating your marketplaces to certain things, right? By the way, if you have any questions, ask in chat. This is Twitch, so just ask away. Now, point number four. Use storage yards to get resources that you need, but only one or two, right? Especially on resources that need to be sent out to buildings. So for example, papyrus needs to be sent to schools and libraries, and uh, linen needs to be sent to mortuaries. So over here, you can see I've got three storage yards, and it's important to note, this housing area and this storage area over here, it's not connected by road to anything. Right? It's not connected by road. All of these resources get here from here. So for example, this storage yard is set to getting pottery and getting beer. We are making pottery and we're importing beer. So pottery is being made over in this area. And as you can see, no road connection to this housing area. So pottery is made and put here. This storage yard doesn't need a road connection to go to this storage yard, which is set to X, well, fill up a certain amount. So it can just go and grab the pottery and bring it back, no problem. Uh, so it goes and grabs the pottery, goes and grabs the beer, comes back. Now these two storage yards here, they are dedicated papyrus and linen. Because when, let's say, this guy goes and gets the papyrus, again papyrus is made over here, he goes and gets the papyrus, and then he needs to send the papyrus to the scribal school. So he has to make an extra trip, right? So this storage yard can deal with two trips for two resources. This storage yard is dealing with two trips, getting the papyrus and delivering the papyrus. And same thing for this linen, only linen, because he goes and gets the linen from over this side, and he has to send it to the mortuary, which is here, right? So one storage yard, it's safe to do two trips, right? Whether it's getting two resources or getting a resource and sending it somewhere, okay? This makes things so much easier because, for example, my linen is being used up here, or pr produced there rather, and this area over here also has a mortuary with linen, right? Because this storage yard is a little inefficiently getting papyrus, uh, beer and pottery, and linen up. Linen is dedicated to here, right? Because this is already making so many trips, but we can do get away with three resources on this one, which is technically this is making four trips. Pottery, beer, papyrus, and then delivering the papyrus. Four trips. But this area here is a smaller area. It takes up fewer resources, so it less often needs to get pottery and beer. Whereas this housing area is massive, thousands of people live here, it needs more. So I get away with two storage yards over here, one just going ahead and getting linen and delivering it to the mortuary. Marco Pastro says, Hi Gimzak, greetings from Brazil. Ah, Brazil. Hope you got over that Civilization VI Deluxe Edition thing. <laughs> anyway, that is point number four. Good, good. So that's four points. We've got ten points today, by the way. I'm going to load up Perwajit, an infamous map. 
This map here is an infamous map because it's sort of broken, right? But I'm gonna demonstrate a few things on this map, right? So point number five. Uh, this one, I do have to credit Sajuk, Super Sajuk, our moderator in chat. He did tell me about this one. It's much easier to manage your food by allowing it to go to a storage yard first and then getting it into a granary, right? So, you can see here this storage yard is currently accepting pottery, a filling pottery, and filling three quarters of figs, right? So filling three quarters of figs. And this granary, you can see here is currently set to accepting figs. Now, we are actually gonna get a harvest any second now. And when the harvest comes in, you'll see that even though the granary is closer, they will send it to the storage yard first. Now, this is important because sometimes you have food requests, right? But also, quite often you need to harvest more food than, than that can fit in a granary. So you can store it in the storage yard first. So you can see here, all the food goes into the storage yard, right? Fills up, and then any surplus gets dumped into the granary, right? But all of this is now filled up in the storage yard. The market lady can only take from the granary, not the storage yard. And you can see the, the farms prioritize delivering to the storage yard first. So now, if I wanted that food to get into the granary, I can set this to getting maximum, or getting however much you want. Let's say I want to fill up to half, right? I want this to get to half. This granary will send out a, uh, these card pushes, Quite a few, couple car pushes there. Eh? Fills it up. There we go. And we're gonna fill it up to half. And it actually went slightly over half there. And then we've got some stored here, 1,200 figs. So if there's a request for figs, we can just send it off. Uh, because it's tricky to get food out of the granary back into the storage yard, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, you can see here, now we've got food. So as soon as the market lady takes more food out of the granary, it goes and grabs more from the storage yard, brings it back. There we go, it's not quite filled. He's gonna go grab a bit more, probably overfilling again. There we go, 1,600 is uh, the midway point. So he slightly overdid it, but there we go. Doing this is more efficient also because let's say you have multiple granaries. You've got one here, let's say you had one up here and one over here you can have a central storage yard, like this one, and the food will be delivered here first, and then all three of these granaries can be set to getting the food. And, whoa, something just fell down. <laughs> Ignore that. Um, all three granaries can be set to getting from that storage yard, so the storage yard is in the middle, and it evenly distributes the food to the three different granaries, right? So it's a great way to centralize the food storage and then distribute it evenly all over the place. Now, unlike storage yards, which don't need a road connection, granaries do need a road connection. Don't ask me why. Uh, so for granaries getting from a storage yard, you're gonna need to hook them up by road somehow. So that is one efficient way of dealing with food, centralizing the food and distributing it. That's always a great way to deal with these city builders, by the way. Centralize everything, distribute. Centralize everything, distribute. Same with like the linen and the papyrus in the previous map. You produce it in one area and distribute it across the map to different storage yards. So it distributes evenly. It's much easier to manage things like that. Anyway, that is point number five. Now point number six, this is gonna be a special point about things being a little glitchy in Pharaoh. Now on this particular map, if we look at the briefing, it asks for 10 modest homesteads. 10 modest homesteads, right? So these are rough cottages. Now to evolve these, they say there's no entertainment to be found in the location. So let's say I go ahead and build a booth, right? We're gonna get some entertainment in here, right? So it's gonna find some employment. A juggler's gonna come out of this juggler's school and these houses evolve. These are ordinary cottages, right? And then it says, there's too little entertainment to be found in the location. So when I first played this map, when I downloaded it from GOG.com with the Cleopatra expansion, uh, because before this, before I got the GOG version, I never played Cleopatra, but the GOG version comes with Cleopatra. So 
I was like, what do you mean there's too little entertainment? Usually what, what that means is we need more entertainment. So if I look at the entertainment thing, some residents want more recreational facilities, more choices in diversions would motivate them to upgrade their home. But on this map, we can't get bandstands, we can't get musicians, we can't get dancers. So where's the extra entertainment gonna come from? So a lot of people, because I had to cheat to get past this, this map, right? Uh, so what I they said is build more booths, right? So let's say I go ahead and put down a bunch more booths here. I'm gonna get four more booths and just to make sure we have enough jugglers, I'm gonna get another juggler school. We'll let all these jugglers fill up and look at that. Still, too little entertainment. So what's going on here? If I get rid of all of these, there we go. Let's clear up this road, these roads before something burns to the ground. So, what's going on? Turns out, the developers did not fix this map when they introduced Cleopatra. In Cleopatra, they introduced the zoo. So, it changed the amount of value that entertainment was acquired. So, there's a hidden entertainment number, right? That is not shown here, right? There's a hidden entertainment number, and it is dependent on your difficulty. So if I go to a review mission here, we're currently on very hard, right? And very hard means that the entertainment, the hidden entertainment value is very high. So what you have to do on this mission is you have to lower difficulty. Now, when it comes to, like, I actually checked, if you are on very easy, one booth is one juggler's booth is required. If you're on easy, you need two. If you're on normal, you need three booths. So for example, I'm gonna drop another booth here. So we'll get a second booth going, right? And we'll speed it up. Get two booths going. And even if I drop down to normal, oh, apparently two is enough on normal. There we go. We win from dropping the difficulty, because on uh, hard and very hard, it's impossible, right? Let's continue governing here, because I want to show you one more thing, right? So, you can see there, I deleted the booth and everything devolves. You see how strange that is, right? They're not losing access to anything, they still have jugglers. Look, as soon as I build it, there's not even a juggler there, they re-evolve. Delete the booth, and they'll go back down. Look at that. That is point number six per wajid being bugged out. <laughs> Covered that. Uh, so you don't have to cheat, you just have to lower difficulty. So again, it needs to be normal. If you're on very hard or hard, you can't win this mission, right? So you need at least two booths on normal and then you'll win because of the hidden entertainment number. Now, that was point number six. Now, point number seven, walker glitches. Now, we can't actually watch a walker glitch right here. Watch this. If a juggler ever spawns and walks up this way, they'll stop right there. This is not for any particular reason of how it's set up as far as I know. It's just sometimes the walkers bug out. Look at that. Look at that glitch there. Um, unless that's the... Let me just check. Is that from the juggler's booth? Because there's a lot of these and it's hard to tell exactly where... So is this one... Oh, this one's not quite bugging out. That one's actually because that's... They actually walk through. But for walker glitches, I can show you a couple over at Bubastis here. So, first one I want to show you. Tax income. This tax collector, if he spawns and walks that way, it looks fine. See this guy? He's gonna walk all the way around, no problem. There he goes, collecting taxes from these palaces, no problem, he's gonna go back home. But if he walks this way and goes up this pavilion and walks back this way, let's see if this guy does it. He's gonna walk up this way, if he goes back the way he came, he's gonna stop right there. Not because he runs out of movement points, if he runs out of movement points, he'll walk back. He just disappears and he's gone. And then he immediately respawns on the right back at the tax collector. And if he does this again, he's gonna walk back to that spot where my mouse is and it'll disappear. So, in this case, these two palaces on the left are not being taxed as much as these two on the right. 
unless he walks straight there, and then it's fine. Right? That's a walker glitch. Now, another walker glitch are dancers. Dancers are the most common walker glitch in Pharaoh. And it's, again, something to do with Cleopatra and entertainment, I'm not sure. But these walker glitches can happen and you, like, your city will fall apart or not work as intended, and you will not be able to tell why until you watch the walkers. Now, dancers are a special one. Uh, you can see here, I've got two dance schools. If I go over to entertainment dancers, there's a pavilion here. These are roadblocks, right? Now, I had to do this so that we have a destination walker. So I have two dance schools and they will send these dancers to the pavilion in the lower right and they will pass the palaces as I walk past them, as they walk past them, right? So no matter what, these dancers will be sent to the pavilion and cover the four palaces. But if we speed things along, look at that. A dancer just spawned here. This house here has dance access. If I look at the map, there's no pavilion here. There's no dance school here. There's just a dancer for no particular reason. See, these houses out here have dance access because dancers just randomly spawn. Or sometimes they don't spawn at all, right? See, there's no dancer that, that's, oh, there we go. One dancer spawned properly in the block there. There we go, a dancer just spawned up here. To provide dancing entertainment to these little houses on the outside. It spawned there. And I, there's, I don't know exactly how this works. I've tried repositioning the pavilion. Sometimes it fixes it, sometimes it doesn't. But this happens a lot, right? You can see on the rest of the map, the dancers are working okay. Down here is fine. There's no dance access there or anything, right? It's just here. So I think this dance, uh, this pavilion is spawning dancers here. And this pavilion is spawning dancers there. It's, it's a walker glitch, right? <laughs> so sometimes it's so, it's so impossible to get the pavilion working. You have to solve it like this. You use destination walker. The dance schools send dancers to the pavilion and you can then use destination walker because they, they're just walking straight to the pavilion. They're not spawning anywhere. They're not wandering anywhere. This is the only way to cover things. On these palaces, it's somewhat okay. On housing areas, it's a little more tricky. You can see here, I built the dance school inside the housing block just to make sure that when the dancer spawns, it will guaranteed cover some houses, right? Because quite often when the dancer spawns, only walks to the right. So I built the dance school here to make sure a dancer actually walks to the left. You can see the dancer just despawned right there, right? Because this dancer here in this left area is not always walking where they're supposed to walk. <laughs> this is the infamous dancer glitch. All right, let's watch this dancer again. Walking this way. And actually, oh, despawned there, right? When they run out of movement points, they should go back to where they came from. But this one, the dancer despawned there. So none of these dancers are actually working as intended. Right? So this one on the left is facing the problem the tax collector is facing, and uh, these dancers are just spawning on the outside road for no reason. <laughs> anyway, that is point number seven, walker glitches. You have to uh, take that into account because uh, sometimes your city is not working and it's not your fault. The game's just not wor working properly. You have to compensate for that. That is point number seven. Point number eight, something I didn't know for a long time, Farmland on the marshes. So if you have farmland on the land, right? So for example, if you were to build a farm right there, you'd want to irrigate it, right? You'd get a water lift and you'd need to build an irrigation ditch to touch that farm, right? That's what they teach you. But these farms on the marshes can also be irrigated. So for a long time, I thought well, if I build farmland on the land, the benefit is it's the same output every year, right? They have a fixed fertility because of the irrigation and it's the same output every year. So what I didn't know is you could irrigate these farms. So I thought because you can't irrigate farmland on the marshes, on the floodplains rather, you can't irrigate these. So sometimes when there's no flood, you'd get very low fertility. 
and then you won't get enough food. But turns out you can just directly irrigate onto the floodplain, no problem. It just connects right up to the water, you don't need a water lift. It would have saved some trouble. But also, again, another tip Sajuk told me, the water lift, uh, water lift there it is, can be placed directly onto the flood plain. So I was for a long time, like only placing these uh, water lifts on the coast of a river or something like that. You can just place it right here, no problem. And you can have the, the, the irrigation come straight out like that. So when it comes to, what, what, as soon as in the campaign you get access to irrigation, make sure you irrigate all these farms. Now they don't need it like to be wrapped around with irrigation. You just need like it touching a little bit, right? But leave some space, like you can see I left space for irrigation and it's worth it. Like you'll probably lose one farm from all of this irrigation. So for example, like that took up a tile, that took up a tile, that took up a tile. So without irrigation, I would be able to fit one more field here. But irrigation makes things so much more fertile, the output will be so much higher. <laughs> so there you go, you can do that. That is point number eight. Irrigation can be placed directly onto the floodplain and water lifts can also be placed on the edge of the floodplain. That's point number eight. Point number nine, sickness in your city. So looking at the health thing, there's a few types of problems, health problems that can happen. There are diseases, there's malaria, and there is plague. They are three different types of health-related problems. Diseases happen when you don't have physicians, right? These guys. These are physicians. These nice square buildings, physicians, they keep away diseases. Malaria happens when you don't have apothecaries these little one-tile things. And plague happens when your overall city health is low. So city health here is very good. If city health drops too low, you end up with plague. Neither of these three things are good. But the note that you want to know is apothecaries deal with malaria. And malaria only happens on maps which have marshland. And marshland is where papyrus reeds come from, right? All these reeds, you can see the papyrus gathering. If there are no marshlands and no papyrus reeds on a map, there is no malaria and you can delete all of the apothecaries, which these take five employees each. So across the city, because you do have to provide health access to any house you put. So you can see here in, uh, if I just, you see I put down a couple houses here, right? To provide employment to this area. Uh, you need to provide health coverage. So on a map which has marshlands, there needs to be an apothecary here, right? But if there were no marshlands, I could delete that. No problem, right? So that's important. And also, just as a note, this is a point I did cover in Caesar 3. Employment means in, uh, in Caesar 3, you have the brown walker that walks out. In Pharaoh, you get these guys. Citizens, these white, uh, white walkers, these guys in white, right? They need to pass two houses to provide employment to a building. So you can see how I've done it here. This in industry area for linen, it's passing these houses here. So I don't need to provide any houses there. This area over here, you can see the road touches up against those houses. But this area here is not touching any houses. So I have to put down a couple houses. Same with here, couple houses there, couple houses there, couple houses there. But for the most part, like you can see here, I had to put down a couple houses there, a couple houses there. This timber industry here, a couple houses there. But here, where I have a housing block, we can see this road back there is just touching those houses on the back. And this road here, these dance schools, there's just very cleverly touching these houses so they get employment. Right? So that's just an, a side note. Not a main point, a side note on employment. Good. Now because Wherever you put houses, you have to put health facilities and a police station to make sure no thieves show up. You can see here, these two houses here have a physician and an apothecary. Good. That is point number nine. Disease, malaria, plague, the health things, and not needing apothecaries on maps which do not have marshland. 
Perfect. Now, the final point for today is point number 10, your aging population. Now, if you go over to the census page, which is here, population census, you get to see their age. Mm. Ah. So here you can see the age. And quite often, people will be saying, I have 5,500 people in my city. Why do I not have 5,500 employees, right? They'll sit, you, maybe you'll go over to this window and you'll see, oh, the city needs 50 workers. So you put down a couple of houses and you see 50 people move in, but you don't get 50 workers. It's because mainly of this. Anyone, as far as I know, right? In Caesar 3, they specified. Here, they don't quite specify, but from what I have looked up, it's true. Anyone below 20 does not work. Anyone above 50 does not work. So out of this graph here, all of the people on the left here, on the left of my mouse here, are not working, and all the people on the right of my mouse here are not working. Only this chunk here is actually working between 20 and 50, and even then, not all of them are working, right? So there's a few extra interesting things here. You can see population over time and all of that, but this census is the most important, right? Because... You can see that 1,864 employed workforce and 67. So we've got about 1,900 people who are workers, right, out of this chunk. So this chunk is maybe about half of my population, which is maybe about 2,750, and only a certain percentage of them are working. So out of 2,700 people, only 1,900 are working, roughly speaking. So that is, what, 60%? So 60% of the people who are the right age are working. So that's how you get massive population. And it's important to note that those below 20 and above 50, they still eat, they still break pots, they still use up all the resources in this house. They'll use up those resources, but they're not actually providing anything to the city. That is one reason why when it comes to completing missions, you have basically 20 solid years. Right? So when people move in, you know, uh, we can actually, let's say we restart this map. We'll replay this mission. And let's get people to move in. And we'll see what age they are. Alright, so th these guys have all moved in. There we go. So we got 63 people. 26 unemployed workforce. And if we look here... Uh, Census. There we go. There's the population. People moving in, they bring in some children. Uh, the majority is between 20 and 40. You can see the high end. There's actually some people who moved in and it's 50, right? You can see there are a few notches, right? Let's go ahead and just bring in as many people as we can for demonstration's sake. Let's let them move in until they stop moving in. So not a single year has passed. These are all just the age of people moving in. There we go. This is the graph of population of immigrants. The majority is like you can see the spike is 20. So these people like maybe let's see we have 400 people, 174 unemployed workforce. So actually that's less than half. Less than half of these people are workers and it's because when people move in uh, where is it? There's a lot of children. Look at that. 0 to 20. All of these people are not working. Right? So... But there, notably, there's only like two bars which are above 50. There's 51 and 52 years old there. So there's already people who are too old to work. These people right here will sit in your city until they die. And they can live up for a long, long time. If we go back to the developed city, which has been running for a while, they're living past 10 years, right? They're sort of, the oldest person is like 62, maybe 63 years old there, right? They do die off, but there's this 10 year period where they're just eating resources. So that's what can happen, right? So if you can finish a map within 20 in-game years, you're fine. But if a map goes on for a long, long time, like forever and ever and ever, then 
you can just tell by the graph, right? The births do not compensate for the immigrants, right? If we were to just let the city run, we would halve our employment, right? So from the current employed workforce of 1,000 uh, uh, employable, so just under 2,000 here, if we did nothing and just let the city run, the birth rate will only be able to compensate for half and our employed workforce will go from 2,000 to 1,000. And this graph here, which says the city has no employment problems, will then go to say the city needs an extra 1,000 workers. So, there are certain maps where you can't avoid going beyond 20, 30 years. You have to play longer because either you can't reach the goals or there's some requirement or something like that. So you have to, over time, just keep adding. Here's a new housing block. Here's a new housing block. Here's a new housing block. You can't just build a housing block and leave it there. You have to slowly bring people in over time. Right? You can't just do that. You have to rely on immigrants because the birth rate just won't do it. And there we go. There is 20, not 20, that's 10, 10 basic tips and tricks for Pharaoh. And that pretty much is, uh, all the points that I would say need to be shared. Now, there's a couple of points that are covered in more detail in the Caesar 3 video. But Caesar 3 is quite different in terms of markets and stuff like that. And then when you move on to Zeus and Emperor, again, they're, they're, it's quite different. Like, for example, in uh, Zeus and Emperor, you don't need two houses here to uh, provide employment. It, the buildings do not need access to employment, they just automatically have it, which makes a lot more sense because this is how people play, right? You don't have to be clever with your roads to touch a house somewhere to provide employment. So Zeus and Emperor don't have that problem. Markets are different in Zeus and Emperor. So the Caesar 3 and the Pharaoh tips and tricks are similar, but still different enough, right? There's no malaria in Caesar 3, right? There's, uh, as far as I can tell, there's no walker glitches in Caesar 3. Caesar 3 is generally seems to be more stable. But, uh, yeah, that pretty much covers it. So, in case you have any more questions, do type it in chat, or if you're watching this on YouTube, in the comment section down below. And, uh, yeah, if uh, hopefully this has been useful for you and that uh, I covered this in a little bit quicker. It's been about 37 minutes, gonna be 40 minutes for this video, a little shorter than the Caesar 3 video, but that's 10 points in less than 40 minutes that hopefully tell you why things just aren't working as you think they should be working. <laughs> but yeah, that's gonna be it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, hope you enjoyed it. Do let me know if you have any more questions and you can join me over on Discord at discord.gg slash gamerzack where I have a city building channel and you can ask more questions. You can submit your own cities to City Building Doctor uh, and I can have a look at them and I will help you fix things up. Uh, and yes, as a, a note by Sul6 Su4, you can build these houses without health buildings, but they will get sick, and when they get sick, people will move out, and then you have to replace the houses to get people to move in. But if there's an invasion or people are unhappy, they will not move in, and then the whole area could die and burn down. <laughs> so, for example, if we did not have these health facilities over here, these houses here will eventually get sick. The population in these houses will drop to zero, this area will lose access, and even if you were to replace two new houses, if there is an invasion, or people aren't happy, or taxes are too high or something, or there's not enough jobs, these houses will not fill up. There will not be new immigrants, and they won't move in in time to make sure to get this firehouse working and the whole area can burn. <laughs> so that is a, a, a note on providing health access to these straggler huts. Yeah. Anyway, that's gonna be it for now. Thank you so much for watching. I'm gonna bring this to a close. Hope you found it useful. My, my name's been Gimzak. This has been 10 basic tips and tricks for Pharaoh. And do check out the Caesar version as well and other city building doctors in case you're having problems. And join me on Discord where you can send me your map. Ah, that's gonna be it for now. Thank you so much for joining and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!